Daniela, welcome to Stanford. Thank you so much for having me. I feel, it's weird. I feel like when I was 18, if I would have even stepped foot here, I would just like burn into ash because I was the dumb <laughs> twin. But my sister would have like thrived. She would have turned into these flowers. Um, I'm sure you would have done great. And it is such a pleasure to have you here. I have to admit, I've been following you on Instagram and you are partnering with some really heavy hitters. <laughs> Selena oh. Gomez. <laughs> Serena Williams. <laughs> DVF, who has actually sat in this very same seat as a View from the Top speaker. I'm going to send her a picture like right <laughs> after this, and she's going to be like, ha ha. But there's actually one star in particular on your posts who I would love to get on next year's slate. OK. Your chief happiness officer, Leo. <laughs> he would love it, but he would just honestly curl up and nap <laughs> so, the whole time. But I think people pay for that. so. That's <laughs> I'm sure we'll all have to find some good questions to keep them engaged. Mm. But in all seriousness, I can't wait to get into your entrepreneurial journey from founding your first company at just 19 years old to recently announcing your third venture in collaboration with JP Morgan. Yes. But your early experiences that got you to this point are equally as inspiring, so I want to start back there. Okay. You've spoken previously about growing up in Florida in a family of hard workers, between your mother, your father, even your identical twin sister. How did those early childhood experiences shape your understanding of success? Wow, well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. Um, I have horrible eyesight. I was just talking to Nora, who's right there with the camera on me, um, saying that it, it was just you know, so odd that my story has gotten me here. Because again, like I just did TED Talk that, I don't want to mess up the mic one second. That's better. Um, I just did a TED Talk at UPenn, and that's where my sister went to hear Stanford, and a lot of my, you know, super smart friends went there, and super successful uh, friends went here, um, or are still here, like Phoebe Gates, etc. And I just always felt so, um, what's the word, like jealous that they got to be among so many other people that excelled in that amazing lane, but it was very different than the lane that I was supposed to be on. So I think in order to answer your question, the first thing I need to say is success looks different. And now I know that. And now that's really the message of Be a Breadwinner. It looks different for everyone. So I grew up in Jacksonville, Florida, the sexiest part of Florida. Uh, no one ever knows what it is. Uh, but I grew up as the dumb twin. Uh, my father, um, who is from Niagara Falls, New York, he didn't go to college. His dad worked in a factory and died very young, unfortunately. And he had, you know, four siblings. And he started working at the age of, you know, 13 and worked his way, you know, washing cars, fixing cars, etc. My mother grew up in Colombia and Bogota. We both have, um, you know, Hispanic upbringings. And she actually grew up even poorer. Um, she lived next to a mass grave. That's how poor. Um, but they were the lucky ones. They had shoes and like an actual roof instead of like a hut. Um, but she worked her ass off. And she was like all of you guys and like my sister. She really excelled at school. And she almost didn't really have a choice. She had to because there were private schools in Colombia and then very, very bad public schools. And the only way she could ever go to a private school was to win the one scholarship that they had every single year. And it had to be the best student. So she literally won it every single year. She didn't have a choice. It wasn't like, oops, if I get a B, it's like survival mode. And her family, you know, just wanted her to become an oral surgeon, a dentist, um, because my grandfather, he still does this. I don't know why, because he doesn't have to anymore, but he still makes dentures. I don't even know what it would be called here. But the whole dream was that she was going to be an oral surgeon. He was going to do the dentures, and it was going to be great and like you know the epitome of success. And so both of my parents know what it's like to go from absolutely nothing to success, but in totally different paths. And I mirror my father a lot, and my sister mirrors my, sis, uh, my, my mother a lot. Um, and my dad was always much harder on me because I think he thought that I was kind of like his son, as like a tomboy. He he's, was such a playboy, and he says that God's curse to him for being a playboy was that he got two twin girls <laughs> <laughs> and never got a son. And so I was like, you know, the one that would fish with him, etc. But um, it's a very long way of me saying that the way that I developed 
my version of success was through school because that's all I knew. I was very lucky to go to a very good school in Jacksonville, Florida. Again, my parents worked their asses off to make sure that we would never have to suffer like they did. Um, and Alex was just always amazing at school. That's my twin. Her name is Alex Astor. She's a New York Times bestselling author. So cool. Uh, but she was always excelling, and I just hated it. And I honestly thought I was dumb, and it's because my teachers told me I was dumb. It wasn't, you know, I didn't have a lot of teachers that were like, no, you might be so good at, like, this other thing. It was like, if you're not good at math and science and history and all these things that honestly, like, sorry, professors in the room, but, like, you, if you're good at all of those subjects like I don't want to hire you on my team I want you to be like amazing at one thing but it made me feel so stupid because I just couldn't learn it and I realized as I got older that I couldn't learn it because I didn't care like I knew I was never going to professionally measure triangles so like why I still wonder someone in the audience please let me know in the Q&A uh, you know the earth's crust how many times I learn about that Am amoeba is like oh my goodness you know Jesus it's like they're preparing us to be like, you know, the Renaissance people of the world. And I just could not get myself to care until sophomore year, when I saw my sister getting letters from places like this and UPenn, et cetera, begging her to apply. And I basically got letters telling me not even to try. Uh, because I was a B and C student. My sister was like, you know, she graduated UPenn summa cum laude, et cetera. So then I was like, okay, if I don't get my shit together, I'm gonna be stuck in Jacksonville, Florida my entire life, and that's not happening to me. So those triangles became very interesting, <laughs> and I almost used it as a path to, you know, instead of caring so much about what I was learning about, and I had professors who, you know, almost liked to bring people down. It was just very odd. Um, I, and liked to, you know, make the comparison of the dumb twin, the smart twin. Like, that was literally my nickname from professors. It was really cruel. Um, hopefully times have changed, but, you know, I, I started basically using something that would become a barrier to me that I didn't know I had, which was OCD. I was undiagnosed. I kind of find, found out I had it um, my freshman year of uh, high school because I took a, a like, a behavioral uh, science class and we talked about like schizophrenia OCD and I was like oh my god that's the stuff I do and even though my parents were in a position to um, get me a therapist a psychiatrist and it would have changed my life they my mother had the shame of like Latinas oh no like you know if, if something hurts like you don't say anything like you you it's just emotional whatever my dad is a very man's man like oh we don't talk about that stuff whatever so I basically got no help from anybody my parents feel very bad now about it, but like times have changed. Um, and so I used that OCD to my benefit. I didn't know it at the time, but when you have OCD and ADHD, which I let, later found out I had, if you love something, you can do it for eight hours straight without even getting up to pee, like truly. And so that's what I did. I, I saw getting out of, you know, Jacksonville, Florida here and then put all the schoolwork here. And I ended up going from almost all C's and B's to straight A pluses. And I think my parents were like, wait, what happened? Like, <laughs> um, and I ended up getting into BU, but that was my first introduction to what does success look like? And it truly felt like if you were not perfect at the things that the professors are telling you you have to be perfect at, at such a young age, in middle school, high school, when you're developing as a person, it felt like you were an outcast, where I see so many successful people, like my friend Rupi Carr, who's the best-selling poet in the world. Um, she actually, uh, her Milk and Honey book outsold Odyssey, which is crazy. Um, and she's, you know, a multimillionaire, and she's a very similar way. And so I think both ways, like what you guys have done to be in this room is so admirable. And I wish I, you know, had tried harder in, in high school before, so maybe I could have been among you all. Uh, but I, I'm still proud of my success story. It's, it's incredibly inspiring. And I, I think it's amazing how you're able to channel that focus into your success uh, in high school, which, as you mentioned, led you to be you. While you were in college, what, that's also the time when you founded your first company, The Newsette. Yeah. What was your motivation for starting a company at that point rather than trying to have a more traditional college experience? Yeah, so basically, it's funny how so many different 
categories are woven through your entire life. And where is this mic? Is it here? Cause I, I, that was me. Oh, okay. <laughs> I like, I, I keep, I keep touching it. Um, but everything, and I'm 28, I'm too young to say this. I feel, I used to feel so young. Now I feel so old in so many rooms, but you know, I'm too young to say this, but I, I've really lived in the last nine years, better or worse. And so many themes come back to almost haunt you, but sometimes in a good way, like the thing you thought was the worst thing in the world, you're like, thank God that happened. And so when I was in, in school, I was so excited when I got into BU, I was thrilled because of the first two years of high school, my GPA, like, you know, average wasn't as good as it would have been if I would have cared the entire time. So BU has this special program called the College of General Studies. And so I was like, okay, great. And it basically, I think it's like the bottom 10% of people who get accepted, they go into the school and you kind of have to prove yourself to go into, you know, the College of Arts and Sciences whatever the F that means, you know, uh, the business school, the comm school, et cetera. Um, and so I wasn't off the hook yet. I had to like prove that I could get into the business school. And so I was still like, oh no, but I'm gonna learn, you know, I'm gonna finally learn things I wanna do and I'm gonna, you know, be a professional because I always just wanted to go out and work. And the first day I go to college general studies, I sit down and guess what the first subject is? Triangles. Triangles. <laughs> And I was like, what the actual fuck? <laughs> and I realized for two years, I was going to be doing the same thing, learning about history, amoebas, all of those things again. <laughs> and you'd think I'd be an expert, but oh my God, I don't even know any of that stuff. But like, I just literally was like, no. And so the first year I was so depressed and I honestly thought like, I got into BU, but like, I can't, magic, like lightning doesn't strike twice. Like, I'm not gonna get into the business school. I just counted myself out because I felt stupid in those classes. I didn't care. I wanted to, you know, use that time to do something. And so very quickly in my sophomore year, I realized, I stopped feeling sorry for myself. And I realized that I actually had an opportunity that I was there and I was lucky enough because my parents, again, worked their asses off to, allow my sister and I to go to college without having any debt or having to have a job. That was the best gift that they could have ever given me. They give me the gift of time. So while they were like, go find yourself and make friends, like that wasn't happening. Uh, I wasn't invited to any parties. I decided to use that time and say, okay, if I am not gonna really care, I'm just gonna kind of, you know, just not fail out, which would be hard. And I'll tell you about that in a second. Uh, harder than I thought. Let me use these next three years where this is the only time in my life I'm not gonna have any responsibilities. I have a bed to sleep in at a dorm. Like I, I just have a few classes a day. Let me use this time if no one's gonna hire me to hire myself after college. And I just got it into my mind. And I don't know where this confidence came from because I had zero confidence. I literally, you know, would wake up sometimes in the morning and think like, what am I even doing? I'm just a waste of space. Like at, truly at 19 or 18, I just, like, you know, I, I didn't feel like I had a purpose in this world. I oftentimes would tell my mom to her horror that I thought I would die young because I, there had to be some inkling of like, I want to be a news reporter. I want to be a scientist, not a fucking scientist. you like, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, but like, you know, I want to do something, but I just could not picture myself doing anything. And so I was like, oh, I guess I'm just like psychic and there's no future and that's it. And my mom was like, what? But she was also struggling because she, her, she dedicated her entire life to me and my sister who are twins. So we left at the same time. And then she just had my dad and she really had no life because she gave up oral, uh, being an oral surgeon because when she came here, she had to take like another course to be certi certified here. And she got immediately pregnant with twin girls. And so she wanted to be a mother. And so she was kind of like losing herself and her independence. And she would call me with her problems. And all of a sudden I felt like I was the parent. And I told my mom, don't worry. I'm going to make it so that we can, me, my sister, her, anyone could make our own decisions because we're gonna have financial freedom because I'm gonna build a company and I'm gonna make us all filthy rich. And she'd be like, okay, honey, whatever. But that is like, okay, yeah, the you, the, uh, maybe Alex, but not you. Uh, 
But she was like, oh, no, like, don't worry about me. But honestly, the worry and the fact that so many women in the world are beholden to spouses who, um, you know, make a certain amount of money, et cetera, and, like, you know, the wife doesn't work or maybe she doesn't make as much or partner, you know, um, woman and woman, man and man, that there's, there's such a power, uh, you know, diff imbalance there. And my mom, you know, even though she had worked so hard, just like my dad, didn't really have any like money of her own. And even though they didn't sign a prenup or anything, like she would have gotten half, uh, but not that they were gonna get divorced, but she just kind of felt like, wait, what is my purpose now? And I wanted to give her that purpose and that freedom. And so that's just stuff I really don't talk about. Like I talk about like, oh, I, I was dumb, so I wanted to hire myself, ha ha. And then that's like the headline. It's also that I wanted to save my mom from ever having to make a decision based on just staying, you know, with somebody because of they would pay for me and my sister's college or whatever. My parents are still together today. I'm like painting it like my dad's like horrible. No, they're like still together today. But like she just like she she could have traveled the world, like go play tennis with your friends. I don't know. But like she just like didn't feel like she had that freedom because she she didn't feel like she had anything of her own. And I was able at 25 to make my mother a multimillionaire because I gave her 15% of my company. And that was the greatest gift that I could have ever given my entire family because now they are free to do what they want. And that's the greatest gift I got as well because I really thought it was gonna be, you know, when I saw millions of dollars in my bank account, I really thought it was gonna be like a F you moment, like I'm gonna go to my high school reunion and whatever. And like, I didn't care. It was like, you know, it, you work so hard and you finally make it and you're in this big apartment that you know used to be owned by the chairman of NBC and you feel like you married a rich guy and you're just like yeah I guess I live here and it's so weird and so you know I kind of pinch myself every day because I was the dumb twin like that was my identity for my entire life only the last four years I was oh she's not the dumb twin she's a smart twin and my sister is wildly successful as well now uh, but everybody no one thought I would be anything like literally anything and so the fact that I'm in this room and I'm it's not like you know this is why you don't do drugs or something like that <laughs> <laughs> I've actually never done drugs that's why I had no friends in college um, but but like it, it's just astounding because I'm I, I know how hard my sister worked to get into Penn and, you know, how hard all of you work to work so hard here and then afterwards. And it really is just like the harder you work, the luckier you get. And I found an opportunity for my, me to work really hard on something that, thank God, became something. But it wasn't luck. I, like, you know, I worked every single second of the day, I was obsessed with it. And it was because I wanted independence for myself, my family, and I also kind of needed a job when I got out of college. I didn't want to go back to Jacksonville. <laughs> I think that's an amazing motivation, and obviously you proved a lot of people wrong. Uh, the Newsette has grown into a phenomenal success. Uh, it's become a next-gen media company and creative agency that now works with over one million customers daily. As you were seeing the early signs of success and the company was scaling, how did you initially think about differentiation and product market fit, considering how competitive and crowded the media space is? Yeah, so um, I wish we had a, a million customers. That would be cool. Uh, no, we have a million um, like readers or reach, um, and they are our customers. The weird thing about media, and honestly, none of you get into media. It is so ridiculous. Like, I wish I sold like a packaged good or something because with a media company, and it, it actually though, it, it while growing it, it made me build confidence. It's like I was a new person and I like grew my shell because it's so complicated. So really quick with media, you don't have one client. Like if you were selling, you know, these glasses that I might need in a second to like actually see faces, because right now I see just a bunch of baked potatoes because I <laughs> stared at my screen for nine years in a row. I, seriously, I had good eyesight. It's really bad. And if anyone can help me here uh, later. But anyways, you know, you don't just have one customer, you have two, because you have to give free value to one customer, 
and basically give them all of your energy and make content and grow the audience, et cetera, for a customer that is not paying you, that's your reader. And then you also, at the same time, have to give just as much energy to the other customer, which is the advertiser. And so there's very few industries where you have to make that huge balance and you can't just focus on one because if you only focus on one, you lose the other one. And so that is something that you know, I, I learned very early on. But for media, um, when I started in 2015, there weren't any newsletters out there. It was like just a few coming up. Daily Candy obviously was a big deal like a um, decade prior, but AOL kind of effed it up and it like, you know, went from like a $100 million valuation to like negative 100 million. And so I think people stayed away from newsletters for a while. But when I decided, okay, I'm gonna start a company, I was like, okay, I'm gonna make a list. What am I good at? And there was nothing on that list. I am not joking or trying to be cute. It, there was, I couldn't even lie to myself. I was like, I'm, no, I'm not good at writing. No, I'm not good at this. I wasn't good at anything. And so I was like, okay, I'm gonna become good at these things. And so I decided that instead of making the list of what am I good at, what do I love to do? And I love to read magazines, which is like, okay, like what are you gonna do, be a professional magazine reader? No, <laughs> I decided to make my own magazine. And I thought, you know, the inbox can be such a toxic place and it's such a white space in the market for actual positive stuff where you're like, you know, uh, I guess trying to refresh your inbox and not looking for like the email from your professor that's telling you something bad or good um, or like, you know, a, a payment for your credit card, whatever. It's like a gift in your inbox. And so that's like the story I tell people. The actual story is I tried to make it a website. I had no idea how to make a website. I was on Squarespace for like 17 hours straight and I just could not do it. So I was like, what, what's easier than a website? Newsletter. And thank God I did that because having a newsletter means that you own your audience. You have those emails. You literally, it's like going to somebody's door every day and saying, hello, listen to me. Um, and they can open the door or they cannot open the door, but having a website, it's like being a car on the freeway passing the house. Like, you know, it, there's no intimacy. I just made that up, so I'm sorry. That was a really bad analogy or metaphor, or whatever. <laughs> Anyways, but like, I was so lucky that I, I kind of stumbled into that because I was differentiated in the market space. There was nothing like me. There were a few other newsletters coming about literally like that exact same time that I didn't know about um, and then I found out about later on. But I was just in my lane. I didn't know how media worked. I didn't know any other media companies. So I just did what I wanted to do. And the newsletter today actually is very similar in terms of topics uh, as it was nine years ago. Well, as someone who can definitely relate to having an inbox that causes a lot of stress, I'm gonna follow <laughs> up with you about tips for that. You, another really unique part of your founder story is that you were able to build this newsletter to a, a very impressive $200 million valuation. And you did that all without raising any VC funding. For any aspiring founders in the room, what are your considerations on the merits and costs of bootstrapping versus raising VC? Yeah, well, first I want to say, you know, it in I think it was last year, the year before I was named by Forbes as the youngest, wealthiest, self-made woman of color in the world. The only woman younger than me and wealthier than me was Kylie Jenner, and I was like, I'll take it. But <laughs> but you know, when I that was like a nice headline and just to be totally honest with all of you, you know, the company is companies just because they're valued one year or something, it doesn't mean that that the value holds that same way. I actually was one of the people who actually proved that value because someone bought a percentage of the company at that valuation. Usually it's like a funding round where it kind of is like a fake valuation and people are people around here are trying, oh, starting to think that um, and figure that out, that profitability is actually uh, quite a nice word and not a bad word. Uh, but I, I'm not gonna sit here and be like, oh yeah, I knew I wanted to just have so much money in my 20s and not have to wait until I exited, if I ever exited, et cetera. I tried to raise money. I, I came right to New York um, 
the way I monetized the newsletter, I knew that I could not monetize until I graduated. I was at least that, the dumb twin had one smart thing in her mind because I knew what if I get a dream advertiser and they're like, oh, can we talk? And I had so many fake emails like, like Sarah at the news at .com, like, because people didn't know. People like would email from like Buzzfeed and stuff and be like, oh, we should do a traffic swap because you're driving so much traffic to our site. And I'm like, oh, let me have Sarah answer you. You know, Sarah was my toenail. And so <laughs> I, so I literally just, you know, I, I faked it till I made it and it was just me and every newsletter subscriber, I literally like could feel like I was getting them. I actually was such a stalker during the time that I was in the classrooms and they were studying, you know, trees and very important stuff that I should never be in charge of. Um, I was on Facebook looking at my friends, well, not really friends, I guess, people who I went to college or high school with, looking to see who their new friends were because Facebook did chronological order there. Uh, so thanks, Facebook. And I would, be, I would be able to say, oh, these are people from their new college. And so then I would DM all of these people that were complete strangers to me and be like, hey, I'm, and as a sophomore, I don't know if you guys can relate, it's really hard to get a cool internship until you're like a junior or a senior. I wouldn't know, I never got an inter internship. I was, you know, me, myself, and Iing. But um, I basically, everyone wants something on their resume. And this was a time where like, you know, stuff to put on your resume wasn't just like out there everywhere. And so I would DM all these random people. I never knew who they were. And I would say, hey, um, and like, I didn't look like a serial killer, so at least they <laughs> knew that much. But I was like, hey, I work at this amazing company called The Newsette. All you have to do is just um, have 10 of your friends subscribe and then you will become an official ambassador and you can put that on your resume, et cetera. And almost everybody I messaged was like, okay, because it was like, I, I, I would put myself, this, this is a lesson for everybody and might be so obvious, but it, some, you sometimes forget even after doing business for so many years as myself, you always have to put yourself in the other person's shoes. Like, what do they want? Like, they're not gonna do something for me because they care. Like, no one cares, like you, got, you have stuff to do, you got shit going on. So I was like, I know these people want something to put on their resume and they want something to be able to be a part of, to like, you know, uh, get an internship, et cetera. So I made it that and I pretended like I worked there instead of I started it because if they saw me and I started it, they'd be like, oh uh, yeah, right. This is like a Joe Schmo thing and it was, uh, but I made it look like it was bigger than it was. And I actually have a really good friend from BU that became an ambassador I had no idea that I was the founder of the company for like two years and she's still like an incredible friend today. Um, I don't remember the question. Honestly, I just started talking. <laughs> well, I think that's the best uh, fake it till you make it story, but it, <laughs> clearly you made it. So I mean, it wasn't building like a car or something that would have been troublesome. Like if I was like, oh, no, just get in. It'll work like uh, no, but it. Obviously, it was so successful that it led you oh, eventually. Oh, okay, yeah, no, sorry, I got the, no. This is actually something that I, I told him I wanted to talk about, and then I just started talking, and it, the words escaped me. So I told you that I really wanted to talk to all of you about the different paths of funding versus bootstrapping. So I, you know, realized that I had to make money, obviously, but I, like in my very long story, sorry about that, I have ADHD and I don't think I took that medicine today. <laughs> um, uh, basically, you, I, I realized that I could not sell anything to advertisers until I graduated because I didn't want like a huge advertiser to be like, oh, can you get on a call? And I'm like, oh no, I have math class. Like, you know, embarrassing. Um, not embarrassing here though. If you're like at Stanford, they'll be like, oh, cool, okay. Uh, but I, I, so one month before gra graduation, it was like just like exams and stuff, I started to monetize. I like opened it up and there were so many brands that came to me like Stitch Fix and Casper Mattress and like all of those guys that I think are still out there. Um, they would come to me and I would be like, oh no, we don't do advertising. And then they want you. So it's like the girl that's like, I don't like you. It's like, oh really? <laughs> like comes back with like a, a dozen roses. And so finally, when I opened the doors to advertisement, I actually made 20 $25,000 in one month. And for somebody with 
overhead of three people, me, myself, and I, that was a lot. <laughs> so I was like, I'm going to New York. And so me and my sister moved to New York, and I had that $25,000, and I had to make it work, <laughs> like Project Runway says. Uh, and <laughs> literally, I just worked my ass off because I knew that was the money I had. It wasn't like some genie was gonna come and give me money. But then I quickly realized, because I realized like, you know, all these people were getting these cool profiles and they were usually men. You know, this was when I was 21, 22, I would email reporters and like pitch myself, which I didn't know was like an ick thing to do for reporters because it's usually like your PR team does it, I don't know, but pitch yourself, who cares? Anyways, um, they were like, oh, so how much have you raised? Every single one of them. And I was like, God, I have to raise money. And I didn't, I should have known because when I was making the presentation, I was like, what am I gonna do with this money? It was like what I was already doing, but sustainably, but it would just take me less time. But I, everyone was getting funding, so I was like, I gotta do it. So I got into, like, I weaseled my way into every room, and I actually got into some pretty important rooms because their associates or their secretaries would um, were readers of the news at, and were like, oh no, you gotta, like, you know, meet with this person. But everyone I met with was, was an old white man. Apologies uh, for all of you out there. <laughs> Anyways, uh, you're great, but. So specifically, there was one old white man who all of you would know, a very, very, very successful investor person, and very old, and he, <laughs> and he, um, I did my whole presentation, and I was so excited. I was looking for a million dollars at a $10 million valuation, and that was that. So I was doing my presentation, and he starts laughing. And I'm like, ha, 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 like laughing with them, like, oh, let's all laugh together. And then he stopped. And I was like, what's so funny? And he said, you remind me of my granddaughter. And I was like stupid enough not to even see that as an insult. So I was like, oh, tell me more. <laughs> um, so I was like, oh, really? She must be like so smart and cool and like entrepreneurial. And he got super dead face and said, no, actually, she talks way too fast and she has no idea what she's talking about. I'm not joking. And literally, like, sat there waiting for me to get up. And I, I actually got that social cue to get up and leave. And I cried the entire Uber way home. Like, that sounds like the end of a Taylor Swift song, but it's true. Like, <laughs> I, I did. And I felt so sorry for myself, whatever. And something I've learned is the measure of success is not how much you win, it's, it's truly, and I, I sound like a baseball player from the 20s or something, but like, you know, it's not about how many times you win, it's about the times you fail and how you react to those failures. And I'm somebody who like, you know, sometimes can cry and feel sorry for myself, but I listen to like one song, like Girl on Fire or something like that, and then I'm like, you know what? F everyone, I'm gonna do it my way. And that's one of my favorite songs, My Way. And uh, it's like, you know, I really uh, chewed him up and spit him out, uh, that investor guy. But I said, you know what? If, again, it was another old white man telling me that I couldn't do what I wanted to do. I skipped over this, but I actually, uh, failed my entrepreneurship project at BU. Uh, it was very fair. I don't know if you guys do something like this, probably not because you're Stanford, uh, but they, it was an entrepreneurship project. And how many of you guys know founders who have uh, eight co-founders? Anyone? Not a good idea. It's like, yes, let me start a company that's gonna be super successful and then I'd love to split it in eight pieces after I have like 1%. Nope, that, not a good idea. But they were like, okay, we're gonna put all of you guys in groups of like nine to 10, like first wrong. Then we're gonna have one of you guys fail. Uh, okay, no, all of us fail if the entrepreneur project doesn't work in real life, but okay, one of us will fail. And the cherry on top was, the professors, AKA the investors or whatever in the real world aren't gonna pick who fails. The other people in your group are. And so it was like so, like and whoever came up with this, and I told the current dean now, and I think they like took that away because I've shit on it so many times, that like, but I, I was the one they picked to fail because I, instead of going out to drink or whatever after we were all done with the project, we, it's something we did like every single day for like six months. I would go home and do my newsletter, and everyone knew that. And so literally a guy that never brought his computer once to any of the meetings, and like, I'm sorry, you can't do a project like that without 
a computer. He didn't fail, I failed. So that meant I failed all of my classes because it was like 70% of the grade. And so I got a nice letter from the dean saying, if you don't get this GPA, retake all of these classes on top of the new classes, on top of doing the newsette, which everyone called, thought my professors called my little newsletter, uh, you are going to be kicked out one semester before graduation. So <laughs> that was the hardest time of my life, and I literally like felt like dying. And that's when I, you know, actually did something about my OCD and went to get help. And it was the hardest semester of my life, but I somehow did it, and I ended up graduating on the dean's list, which is like a much better letter to get from him. He was also an old white guy. I'm, <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. And my dad's one, um, but. <laughs> but I, you know, I, I realized at that moment, okay, another old white guy, the, back to the investor guy, the really old mean guy, I, the one that made me cry. I was like, I, am I going to let him define me? Mm -mm, even though, like, I should have been like, yes, sir, like, I am a failure, goodbye. Uh, because he was so, he still is so successful, I think. I don't know. I don't, like, Google him every day or anything. Uh, I'm joking. But I, I was like, am I going to let that happen? And I said, no. And I, I it's probably sounded so stupid. I didn't tell anybody this, and thank God I didn't, because this was so far-fetched, and thank God I'm so stubborn. But I said, instead of getting a million dollars from four white old men in suits, from, like, four investors, let's say, I'm going to get a million dollars from 200 companies if it takes those many for advertising. And that's what I did. And in 2019, we did a million dollars in sales. 2020, we did 7 million. And 2021, we did $40 million in sales with eight figures of profit. And because I never took on an investor, because all of them laughed me out of the room, I was able to write myself an eight-figure check. Uh, and deposit into my bank account. And so all the founder friends that I have, um, this is a cautionary tale, but, you know, all the founder friends I had that raised at a billion dollar valuation and owned like 2% of the company and, and they were like, you know, so cool and laughed about my company. I had like lots of money in the bank and they had like 200K from secondaries and then their company tanked. And they like bought like an eight million dollar house before. Like there are some horror stories. So people don't tell you that. People don't tell you the parts where it's like, oh yeah, that person's so successful, but like it, it, all these valuations finally caught up on them, and they're never going to sell for that much. They're going to sell for half, mean, meaning they're not going to get one penny. So like that one million dollars you got in secondaries, but you bought like a hundred million dollar house because you thought you were going to be a billionaire. Sorry, like you're in debt now. You know. So I was in a very unique position, not just among women or. Latinas or whatever, among men too, where I had a lot of money at 25 years old and no one else that I knew did because it was all fake money. And so it worked out for me. And the reason why, again, the valuation of that company was so high is it's four times you know, our revenue that year. Um, and we had an agency, we worked with companies like Amazon, Mattel, et cetera. Um, and it, it was a lot of hustling and struggling and you know, we, th there were definitely lucky points. DVF that, you know, sat here. I actually flew with her the first time I ever came to um, Palo Alto. We stayed in um, Ann Wojewski's, uh, or NW, guest house. Um, and I was like watching Shark Tank with like the Google Airs. Uh, <laughs> they were so cute. But um, I, she, I came here because I convinced her for her in charge movement to do something with Facebook and I met Mark Zuckerberg and I shook his hand and I started to sell him at 23 years old and she was like, stop it. And then we like died laughing the whole way back. But she's the one that opened so many doors for me, like introducing me to Amazon and that became one of our biggest clients and you know, was responsible for tens of millions of dollars of revenue over the years. So even though there were a lot of people early on who might not have believed in you, it sounds like you ended up finding a really strong support system of people who did. Yeah. And for your second company, I know you were able to co-found it alongside Selena Gomez and her mother, Mandy Tifi. Yes. The company of Wondermind to destigmatize and democratize mental health. Yes. One of the main concepts of Wondermind is this idea of mental fitness, exercising our minds like we do our bodies. Yes. To a room full of type A overachievers who could probably benefit from incorporating some of those practices? How should we be prioritizing mental health relative to our other priorities? So the reason why I don't get nervous for these things is because 
I have long, long gone are the periods where I care about what people think about me because I cared so much. So I will just share a secret with you all. I would be a fucking hypocrite if I told you guys I knew the answer to that question because I'm still not there, but I'm trying. Um, I started Wondermind with Selena and Mandy because I realized that I all of a sudden lived in this like, you know, eight figure apartment. I, I literally could spend hundreds of thousands of dollars a month and it didn't even matter. Like, you know, I went from like, just, you know, not even getting, I didn't get paid from the newsette and, and only like the incidentals and stuff. Like it, went, it was a really big jump and I wasn't happy. And I realized that maybe, you know, the freedom was great, but the material stuff wasn't making me happy. I wanted to figure out what would. And I have realized that whenever I speak on, you know, a panel for Forbes or a keynote speaker at, you know, something like this, and I am open about my OCD, ADHD, depression, that so many people come up, like there was literally like a, a conference where there was a huge celebrity that spoke right after me. And then I had a line like I was, you know, like a huge celebrity because people were like, wow, I can't believe you say all those things about yourself. Like, that's kind of embarrassing. And I'm like, yeah, and then some people would be like, I have OCD too, you know? And it, I realized that, wow, like by me being so transparent, it was actually making people either be like, wow, she's a fool, or like, wow, maybe we should talk about this more. And so I think that I'm a strong believer in the only way to change the world, and this is a very capitalist mindset, but it's a realistic one. The only way to change the world is to prove that your change can make a lot of money. And so instead of starting a fund or you know, a, a charity or something, I said, let's start a business. And just like you know, 15 years ago, I don't know how old you guys all are. Again, I have no glasses on. Uh, I'm 28, but you know, 15 years ago, if I wanted to go to a yoga class, I had to drive you know, in Jacksonville, Florida to the yoga studio, sweat, drive myself back, whatever. That was my only option. Then, all of a sudden, 10 years later, now, you, or 15 years later, you can literally have access to hundreds of free workout apps and do yoga in like your car if you want to, you know, and like with a goat, and, <laughs> and it's free. And so I realized, wow, like that market was so small. And then as soon as people re started realizing, oh wait, you can make money, like Lululemon and SoulCycle, what, and then all of a sudden it became bigger and bigger, then, all of these resources are free for people. People don't have to even pay for like a gym membership because basically people are giving it to you for free because it's all funded by VCs and Wall Street. It's kind of funny to think about. So I thought we're gonna make this the biggest company ever and help people at the same time so that we can do the same thing that physical fitness did where in hopefully five or 10 years, people won't even have to pay for a psychiatrist or a therapist because there'll be so much money from Wall Street and from investors paying just for them to be a user, you know? And so that was my goal and still is my goal to destigmatize and democratize mental health and to treat it like mental fitness. And so going back to the hypocrite part, is, you know, I think, I think everyone in this room, if you want to be an entrepreneur, you have to be really honest with yourself because you are just like the race to get into Stanford. You are up against the best and brightest and you, if you don't work your ass off, someone else will. And it's okay if you don't want that life. I envy people who don't have that life, to be totally honest with you. And I have a curse where I just can't stop. I have to keep going. And so um, hopefully I figure that out. But making therapy a priority I still is a struggle for me. And so, like again, I don't want to be a hypocrite and be like, oh, now I like float in the air and meditate. That's not the case. But I do do yoga now like three times a week and started meditating. Um, I thought it was like a fake thing, but actually it's real. Um, and I, I, my uh, Nora, who's in the front row, my right and left hand, she like literally makes me feel bad if I don't do my um, therapy sessions because I'm somebody who doesn't like to talk about my feelings. I just want to keep going, going, going. And I've been in survival mode for the last nine years of my life. And so I would encourage all of you to not learn the hard way through multiple burnouts and, you know, just 
really tough parts of your life um, to start you know, your journey with those practices, with working out, with walking with friends, with making family a priority. I didn't go home for Christmas for three years. You know, making those things a priority before you, you even start because here I am n not having to hustle every day like I used to and I still do and I still miss Christmas last year. So I would just caution all of you guys and just take care of yourselves first because I've learned the hard way that if you don't take care of yourself, you can't take care of anyone else. One of the themes that I, I really drew from in your story is this idea of empowering others, which brings us to your latest venture, Be a Breadwinner. You just announced it last month in collaboration with JP Morgan and the CEO of their wealth management arm, Kristen Lemkow. Yes. As you're building this company and looking to the future, if you could use that to redefine tomorrow in one way, what would it be? That's a great question. So again, I told you guys in the beginning, you guys are probably like, where, I, I can't even follow this conversation, but I promise you there's a through line. It's like Dave Chappelle and his like comedy specials. Like you're like, where is he going? And then at the end you're like, that was the first joke. It all connects. <laughs> I promise it's gonna connect. Uh, I just saw him because um, one of my business partners and someone that I'm close to, um, his team is Kevin Hart, and I was lucky enough to watch him get the Mark Twain Award, and then when Dave Chappelle came on, I was like, oh my God. Uh, anyways, so sorry to disappoint, just me. Uh, but I, it all comes back. So everything I've been saying today is, uh, is kind of the thesis of what I'm about to say, which is the mission of Be a Breadwinner. The mission of Be a Breadwinner is for anybody and everybody to build financial freedom and their future. And the one thing I have realized through all these years is money can't buy happiness, money can't buy friends, like, you know, money can't buy that stuff. But you know what the, it can buy? Money can buy freedom. Freedom to what? Freedom to leave a toxic relationship freedom to quit the job you hate and start a new job or start an entrepreneurial journey, freedom to change the world. And so my, to answer that question, if I could change the world in one day, it would be the mission of this company, which is barriers, make your barriers your building blocks. And so I wish everybody could wake up tomorrow with zero bias of, you know, are you a woman? Are you a woman of color? Are you a male of color? Are you, do you have dyslexia? Do you have a mental health problem? Are you from the wrong side of town? All of those things, nothing matters. All that matters is you get to the mat and whoever performs, performs. That's what I wish we could have in society and that's what Be A Breadwinner is all about because it's for men and women, but it's for everybody, even people in this room. Clearly, all of you guys, you know, are empowered in some way because you're, you know, here and uh, it's thriving. But it's for everybody to kind of ignite that voice in your head and say, wait, like, just because I'm, you know, a, I don't know, a psychology student, but like, maybe I want to be an entrepreneur. Do it, like just do it. You know, anybody can do anything. And if I'm living proof of that, and my goal is to take that Forbes, you know, title and give it to someone else as quickly as I can, because it is ridiculous that at 27, I was the youngest, wealthiest, self-made woman of color in the world, when the male equivalent or the white male equivalent is probably 13 in someone's basement making like Bitcoin or whatever. <laughs> Did you make Bitcoin? I don't know. but. Like, I just, that's, that's, that's my, my concept and JP Morgan Wealth Management and Kristen Lemka, they were such fantastic partners for the launch, the soft launch, it still hasn't officially launched yet, but this is my ecosystem of everything that I have, I have proven and my story and everything and none of my businesses have ever been me first. I didn't want to start a blog about myself. I like hate seeing myself in pictures when I see my sister on TikTok. She's my identical twin. I'm like, oh my God, like, uh. but uh, she, you know, uh, this is a this is kind of like my way of taking everything that I've learned and my personal story and literally saying if a Latina with no funding, no uh, pedigree, no belief like from anybody except you know family members, no connections, no help, no anything was able to build that kind of not on paper wealth in the bank wealth at 25, 
anyone can do it. I promise. It's just about breaking down those barriers and making them your building blocks. The more barriers that you face, stack them up even higher. Because I promise you that every single weakness that you think is a weakness is actually your strength. And that's something that DVS is all the time. Um, so I totally just stole that from her. But it's so true. That woman's an oracle. She literally has predicted my entire life. Uh, but seriously, ev ev every person here is not only capable of changing the world, but also changing your life and other people's lives. And just because maybe you have some sort of preconceived notion of what it is you want to do with your life, if you feel like you want to do something else, go for it. Just put yourself in a position where you can, you know, and that's where financial freedom and practicing financial fitness comes in. So, yeah. I think that message has the power to inspire and help a lot of people. So thank you so much. It's really sharing. hard to inspire this crowd because it's like, <laughs> you guys already are great. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, with our last couple minutes, I think we have, I'd like to turn it over to the audience for Q&A. I think we'll have time for one question and then we'll wrap up with a view from the top lightning round tradition. Oh. So if you have a question, please raise your hand and one of our mic runners will give you the mic. Hi, I'm Trip. Oh, it's Hi. Um, I so you, last year, Andy Dunn came to speak with us, and he has bipolar disorder, and spoke about how he's managed that and like built a business. I'm curious, like with your mental health situation, how have you, like how a how have you managed like depression, OCD, ADHD, but also how have you turned those things into strengths for yourself, like through this process? Great question, uh, and love the hat. You're definitely, <laughs> a, a dermatologist definitely told you you need to stay out of the sun, and you're, is that it, yeah? <laughs> I need one too. Um, so Andy Dunn and I actually co, did like a co um, keynote for Forbes a couple years ago, where we talked about like, you know, d having mental health illnesses and, you know, thriving past that, and that's a really good question. So my OCD, again, everybody's journey is different, but when I failed that project and I realized that it was so unfair that this group, this group of people just could decide my fate because my fate would have been getting shipped right back to Jacksonville, Florida, and I don't think I would be here today. It made me so upset and angry and numb that my pre, you know, night, nightly rituals, because when you have OCD, some, some people have rituals like, okay, uh, you, you, the difference between being like uh, psychotic and having OCD is that you know that things that you think aren't true, but you still have the intrusive thoughts. And so it's like, if I don't look under the bed every night before I go to bed, my mom's gonna die. And like, you know it's not gonna happen, but it kills you. And so those rituals, I would look under the bed and I would like, until the bad feeling went away and it wouldn't go away. And I would slap my hands and one time they literally were bloody. And my boyfriend uh, at the time, who's still my you know partner today and was actually the COO of my company for quite a while, but that was literally when I was just starting my company, he took it upon himself and I will never be able to thank him enough for doing this because I would have never done it myself. He found me a therapist and he found me a psychiatrist and I paid for it with my like little affiliate money because I could not have my parents know about it. And I actually got on medicine and I'm still on it today, Prozac. And Prozac has enabled me to completely take away all of the intrusive thoughts. So no longer do I feel like, ooh, I have to tap this five times or anything like that, which is, it was such a curse. So it, it's such a blessing not to have that. But my OCD does manifest in other ways. Um, but that was crippling. And so that's something that I did. My ADHD, I didn't actually get diagnosed with that until like two years ago, and it explains a lot. Uh, but now I'm also on medicine for that, um, and I'm able to now kind of like, if I'm you know super anxious or if I'm obsessing about something, I can say, it's your OCD. It's like you kind of like can, everything is 
less scary when you can put a name and a face to it. So it's like in Monsters, Inc. when like, the, <laughs> I have so many great analogies today, uh, when like the monster comes, but you're like, oh, like you're cute, like, and I'm gonna name you, whatever. Then it's not as scary. That's kind of how it is now with my OCD, ADHD, and depression, because it's like, oh, it's just my OCD coming out, and I have these tools and remedies to solve it, or like I'm going to, you know, I used to give up and just take a nap for three hours. I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna go for a walk and I'm gonna re-inspire myself. And so truly for me, the way that I've been able to continue on is having a mission that's greater than myself. Um, I want to help people and I want to change the world and I can't do that if I'm going to be depressed in my bed all day. I, I do it for every single person that thought that they could be successful but decided not to even try because they have ADHD, because they didn't go to an Ivy League school, because they were a person of color, because they got laughed out of a room by an old man with some sort of granddaughter issue, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I, that, that's why I do it. And so I think having a purpose that's bigger than just making money, you know, that also helps because there, I have really bad days. I mean, Nora can tell you, like I, there's times where I, you know, just cry and I, because it's hard. If you're an entrepreneur, you're not getting punched in the face 20 times a day, you're not doing it right. Like you just aren't. And I kind of the recipe for the person who should never be an entrepreneur, but I still am. And so I guess that like kind of literally closes it all out with the fact that like just because you have all of these barriers that history and statistics say will not work for success, you can actually make a new recipe. And that's why I built Be a Breadwinner and why I'm so excited for the launch is because it really is for somebody who wants to have success on their own terms and be a barrier breaker, a bread taker, the new mold of a money maker. Well, it's clear that nothing is gonna get in your way or stop you. <laughs> Before I let you go, we do have to finish with this view from the top tradition. It's a, a quick lightning round. Okay. So I'm gonna ask you, five, or give you five short phrases and you're just gonna finish it with the first word or short phrase that comes to mind. Oh God, I came back to college and I have to do work now. <laughs> Pop quiz. Okay. Biggest difference between you and your twin sister? She was, she loved school. <laughs> uh, favorite article that you wrote for the Newsette? I wrote the Newsette every single day for five years from 5 a.m. to 10 um, a.m. every single weekday, even when we made a million dollars because I was so cheap with the money. So I don't even remember, but like I, I've written thousands of things. Mental fitness technique that works best for you? Um, I actually just started doing yoga three times a week before work, and I used, usually I used to think that meditation was like a myth, but it's totally not. Um, I'm not like good at it or anything yet, but the breathing works, and so there's like thing, something called a box breath situation where you like inhale one two three four five, hold it one two three four five, exhale one two three four five, hold it one two three four five. I might have messed it up, and all of you guys are gonna like get an aneurysm, but like <laughs> that, I think I'm pretty sure it was that. And I've actually used that recently, so it's a recent, you know, discovery. Most played song by Selena Gomez. My mind and me. I'm partial to same old love, but we'll let it slide. <laughs> And last but not least, I know you were just on the Mario Lopez Access Hollywood for an interview. Which one did you have more fun with? <laughs> oh, like this one Mario or this Lopez one or, or you? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I got I definitely had more fun with you. There we go. <laughs> right <answer. laughs> you, pa you passed the pop quiz. <laughs> Danielle, it has been such a pleasure. Thank you so much. And we are so excited to see all your continued success moving forward. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.